All right, buongiorno. Straight off the operating table, it's your boy, Big Rich. Mob Story Season 2, the surgery was a success, but now I deal with the pain. And it's insane, as they say. But uh, I'll be grounded for at least three to four days, can't go to work. But that doesn't mean we can't conduct business. And if you don't understand that, then you understand the grind never stops. And if you don't understand that, I can't really help you. Gentlemen, wipe your feet on the rug. Blow some smoke in the atmosphere. I got my medicine for the next few days. Pineapple Express and Black Fire. Straight from the pages of the button guys of the New York Mafia.com. That's www.thenewyorkmafia.com. The Cherry Hill Gambinos, part six, the final chapter. And of course, today's video is sponsored by Justice Tech Pros. Subscribe to Justice Tech Pros on YouTube. Go check them out. Dominic and the whole team hope everything is well. Hope you're safe. Stay healthy. And, uh, you know, there's madness going on in the streets right now with this coronavirus. So, hey, I am applying the three, I'm applying the three foot rule. Three foot in front of me, behind me, left and right. I stay three feet from everybody and I ask everybody to please stay away from me. That's the way you're going to stop spreading it, all right? And take care of the elderly, mind them. All right, let's get right down to business. Cherry Hill Gambino's part six, the final chapter. Of course, written by MS. Quote, wherever I went, especially with Joe or John, I was treated like royalty, a president or governor. It was the good life, like being part of a government. And we were. There's the government of the United States of America. And then there's the government of the Sicilian Mafia of America. Unquote. By informant William Kane, a disgraciad on the Gambino brothers. With Joe and Rosario out of the picture, Joe's drug trafficking and tax evasion trials behind him, and John having recovered from a stroke, the two brothers went about their business as usual. The spotlight seemed to be off them for the time being, or so they thought, and John and Joe stayed in the shadows, quietly maneuvering their way around any trouble that came their way. But a big problem had walked through the doors of Cafe Giordano, and it was a problem that was going to force the brothers into the biggest fight of their lives. An upstanding American citizen. In a 1989 Courier Post interview, businessman William Kane had described himself as Damon Runyon-esque, delving into bookmaking, loan sharking, burglary, and a lot of tough talking and chest puffing. He was even indicted in 1984 for his part in a 1974 murder. The charges were eventually dropped after it was discovered he was a liar who knew just enough about the murder to sound convincing when he talked tough to other crooks. Kane was also the owner of the B&B Amusement Company, which had installed cigarette vending machines in Joe's Valentino's nightclub in Cherry Hill. The day after the devastating fire at the club in October 1982, Kane went to recover cigarettes that might have escaped damage from the fire. Prior to that day, Kane only had a passing acquaintance with Joe, but while retrieving his undamaged cigarettes, Kane struck up a more in-depth conversation with the club owner. That conversation eventually turned into the subject of video poker machines, which was a part of Kane's business. At some point, according to Kane, Joe brought up the idea of forming a business partnership to install video poker machines in Brooklyn. Even though he had heard the rumors about Joe's alleged mafia associations, Kane decided to give Joe the benefit of the doubt and went into business with him, with Joe supposedly becoming a secret partner in B&B. Kane claimed that his business partnership with Joe had blossomed into a friendship, and he dined, fished, and traveled with them, attended weddings and christenings with them, and even visited John's home in Florida. In the same Courier Post interview, Kane said that, quote, John and Joe control everything on 18th Avenue in the Bensonhurst section of Brooklyn. That's the stronghold of the Sicilian Mafia in the United States. Nothing moves there without Joe and John's approval, unquote. It meant that Kane had the market on the video poker machines business on 18th Avenue, which allowed him to pull in over 300000 a month in profits. He even had a machine inside Cafe Giordano. 
Sometime between 1985 and 1987, a local FBI agent by the name of William Stolarski had approached Kane about helping the FBI obtain evidence that John and Joe were involved in an international drug ring. And he wanted Kane to help them prove that Cafe Giordano was a heroin auction house. The FBI called this investigation Operation Iron Tower, which was being conducted in conjunction with Italian authorities. The revelation floored Kane, and the idea of Joe and John being involved in drug trafficking didn't sit well with him. He thought it was un-American. Stolarski told Kane the FBI was outmanned and outgunned, and that they can't win without help from a silent majority. He also told Kane that a gangster dealing in drugs wasn't an honorable life and was poisoning children. Kane said that after talking with Stolarski, he started noticing something strange about the Gambino brothers, even after being immediately around them since 1982. It was a society where people whispered all the time and nobody works, he said. It was a place where everybody had a Porsche, Ferrari, BMW, and Mercedes, and no one works. There was more gold on people's necks and in their rings than Tiffany had in his stores. They drank Don Perignon by the truckloads, but nobody works. So despite the fact that he really liked Joe, Kane agreed to help the FBI. A disgrace. After all, he told the Courier Post he was a red, white, and blue patriot. I have a big American flag flying in front of my house. How can I fly the flag and ignore the people who are trying to destroy my country? This is your last stance. In 1985, Kane helped the FBI install bugs throughout Cafe Giordano, including above John's favorite table and in a video machine. Kane claimed the surveillance continued for three years until December 1988. However, the FBI contradicted those claims starting in court documents. That surveillance hadn't begun until March 1988. Despite Kane's claim that the Gambinos had an extensive surveillance operation, which included sweepers and a cop who would identify FBI vans, the Gambino brothers were largely unaware of what was happening around them. The bugs picked up many conversations, including one about a wine matter. Authorities claimed that the wine matter was code for heroin and not related to any legitimate wine importation matters. They said that the brothers and their co-conspirators were putting liquid heroin in the bottles of Coro brand Sicilian wine and moving it into the United States via the Dominican Republic. Authorities added that the Gambinos did this without the knowledge of the winery involved. The FBI claimed that Joe was in charge of the operation and to prove their point, they claimed that Joe had traveled to the Dominican Republic in 1987 to meet with others involved in the scheme. There was also conversations of Joe and John speaking in the Sicilian language, apparently openly discussing their criminal activities. The FBI recorded hundreds of hours of conversations that they claim implicated the brothers in numerous crimes. On December 1st of 1988, the Cafe Giordano was featuring a new Italian singer who was entertaining a crowd of, of about 100 people. After the entertainment ended around midnight, FBI agents who were inside the club took the microphone and announced, Ladies and gentlemen, this was your last dance. The crowd thought it was a joke until other FBI agents stormed the cafe and ordered everyone not to move. The raid which took place concurrently in New York and Italy, resulted in over 200 arrests. Although Joe was arrested, John was not, because the FBI said they didn't have enough evidence against him. The following day, Joe was released on $3 million bond and put on house arrest with an electronic ankle monitor. Fairy tales. In 1990, Joe appealed before Judge Peter K. Leisure, who was presiding over the case to have surveillance tapes from Cafe Giordano thrown out. His first challenge was that Judge Constantino, who authorized the surveillance, hadn't read 1,464 pages the FBI had given to support their request. Apparently, the feds filed their application and the judge signed the order simultaneously at 1151 on March 9th of 1988 
But Judge Leisure dismissed Joe's complaint, stating the court believes that Gambino bears a heavy burden to show that disrespected federal judge signed an electronic surveillance order without considering to his satisfaction the material submitted in support of the government's applications. Yeah, but you got to read the thing first, though. How'd you read 1,500 pages on the same day? Joe also challenged the timing of the bugs, saying that they were installed as early as 1985, at least according to Kane's claim in the 1989 Courier Post interview. The FBI countered that although there were bugs in the Cafe Giordano back in early 1984, when it was known as Cafe Milano, no authorized bugging took place at the Cafe Giordano prior to March of 1988. However, the feds were forced to produce Kane for live testimony. Kane testified that he never assisted the FBI in bugging the cafe prior to 1988 and that he believed the Courier Post articles were not factually correct. In fact, on cross-examination, Kane stated that he might have made that date up. This was in relation to placing a bug above John's favorite table in September of 1987. The journalist who conducted the interview, however, said he obtained proof about what Kane had told him. The writer's notes were subpoenaed to see if there was evidence of illegal bugging, but the journalist and the Courier Post successfully fought the court's subpoenas. In addition, Joe referenced two lines in the Courier Post article to further his argument that the devices were installed prior to 1988. The Courier Post article stated that Kane's video poker machines proved to be a good place to put listening devices. Beginning in 1986, they became a confessional for mafia crimes. Under cross-examination, Kane denied ever having poker machines inside the Cafe Giordano and did not know if there were bugs inside his other vending machines. And despite the evidence, the court ruled in the government's favor, stating there is no evidence that the government agents executing the surveillance order did not act in objective, good faith reliance. We could go on, but I think the picture is clear. Every one of Joe's challenges to suppress the tapes were denied. Eventually, Kane was branded as a liar by the prosecution themselves and was dismissed. So they turned to another informant who happened to be a defendant in the case, Giovanni John Zarbano, a disgrace. The prosecution wanted to prove that John was the head of the Sicilian faction of the Gambino family and that he also headed an international drug ring that allegedly bought more than 200 million worth of heroin and cocaine into the U.S. Say it again. Two hundred million. Charbonneau told the FBI that John had met with John Gotti in April of 1907 and that Gotti had arrived at the cafe in a limousine with three bodyguards. Charbonneau also testified that in March of 1987, five different capos from five different La Cosa Nostra families met with John Gambino in the back room of Cafe Giordano. The capos went back one at a time, Zarbano said, and discussed business with Gambino. Based on that testimony, John was finally arrested on January 4th of 1990. He was charged in a superseding indictment with narcotics trafficking, illegal gambling, loan sharking, and extortion. On January 5th, 1990, he was released on $2 million bond and was placed under house arrest with electronic bracelet monitoring. Serbano's testimony also caused attorney Charles Carnesi, who represented another defendant, to be dismissed from the case after Zarbano testified that Carnesi was basically in bed with the mob. Carnesi was later reinstated. But according to a gangland news report, Zarbano changed his mind and accused federal prosecutors of pressuring him to testify falsely against the Gambino brothers. He claimed that prosecution tried to get him to lie and corroborate another witness's story and to involve John Gambino in drug deals and murders he did not know about. The government wasn't about to give up, though, and looked for help from a trio of master sewer rats, one of which had provided information about the brothers' involvement in a 1981 murder. Because of this new information... 
John and Joe were hit with another charge, conspiracy to murder. So, John and Joe decided to create a new, more interesting storyline in their saga. Miami Vice, John and Joe style. John and Joe had already endured months of lying witnesses and prosecutors who kept adding or changing charges in hopes of securing a conviction against them. John had tried to get himself severed from his brother's case because of his medical disabilities, but was denied. The brothers were starting to lose faith in the system and didn't know how their upcoming trial in February 1993 was going to be any different than what they had already been experiencing. Still, they tried to make the best of a bad situation. Since their arrest, Joe and John were still under house arrest with ankle bracelets. In 1992, they appealed to the government that enough was enough and they wanted the ankle bracelets removed. Surprisingly, the government acquiesced and requested that the court cease the electronic monitoring. The request was approved. However, on September 1, 1992, the brothers failed to appear in court for their arraignment hearing. The lawyers and family did not know where they were or what happened to them. The only thing that was known that John was supposedly headed for Houston for a doctor's appointment. But it appeared that John and Joe had bigger plans, deciding to jump bail. As a result, law enforcement launched an intense international manhunt for the brothers with a focus on South Florida. According to authorities, the brothers had many friends who could help them escape to Venezuela where John owned property. John and Joe's names and pictures made headlines across the world and federal authorities made sure the general public knew the brothers were very dangerous. To drive the point home, FBI spokesman Paul Miller told newspapers some time ago they were both involved in a conspiracy to kill an Italian magistrate, a magistrate who was eventually murdered. While that seemed to be a widely circulating rumor, it was a rumor that was never substantiated. Still, the brothers were on the lam, and the government wanted them found. And as it turns out, it wasn't that hard to find them. Apparently, John and Joe decided to hole up at the secluded and plush South Haven Hotel and apartments in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, a city which John had frequented many times in the past. And unidentified hotel clerks told newspapers that the brothers had been staying at another hotel nearby but switched because they wanted a cleaner place. She added that they had registered under different names, one of them signing in as Tony D'Amato from Sicily. They were also sharing a four-room suite for which they paid cash. She also shared that they were likely to work out by the pool. Unfortunately, the exposure was what ultimately led to their capture. After 17 days in hiding, John and Joe were caught and arrested on September 22. Authorities were searching for a man with a limp because one Florida detective had remembered John walked with a limp when he was surveilled at a meeting with John Gotti in Fort Lauderdale in 1989. At one point, John was out taking a leisurely stroll off hotel grounds when he was spotted. Even though he had grown a beard, authorities had a sneaking suspicion that they had finally caught at least one of their men. A detective followed John back to the hotel and alerted other members of the task force who then found Joe exercising by the pool. Later around midnight, FBI agents and Broward County detectives cleared nearby rooms and knocked on John and Joe's door, identifying themselves. When they didn't answer, the agents broke down the door with sledgehammers. The brothers didn't resist, no weapons were found, and authorities took him into custody. FBI agent Dan Clingston told reporters, I don't think they left the joint. They were snug as a bug in a rug, in an excellent place to hide. You don't stick out in Fort Lauderdale. It's just like Broadway. But at least one guest disagreed. A Danish tourist who was visiting Fort Lauderdale with her son and mother told the Florida paper that the two men did not seem to fit in. My son said they looked suspicious, she said, but I thought he had seen too many American movies. And of course, just like a good Hollywood movie, a woman, 16-year-old son, ran to watch the events unfold after hearing the commotion. He even videotaped the drama. John and Joe's bail jumping adventure didn't come without consequences either. Not only did they forfeit their combined $5 million bond, but it was another charge that was added 
to their already lengthy list. Both brothers were returned to New York, but they would have to sit behind bars at the Metropolitan Correctional Center until their trial began the following February. Facing the Music On February 1st, 1993, Joe and John's trial began, along with two other defendants who were grouped into this trial. Because of their bail jumping adventure the previous September, law enforcement wasn't taking any chances with the very dangerous Gambino brothers. More than a dozen armed federal marshals guarded the shackled brothers as they made their way from the MCC to the courtroom. Additional guards were placed in the hallways and walkways because they knew that the 52-year-old John Gambino, who walked with a limp and a cane, and his 46-year-old brother would take advantage of any opportunity available to escape from federal custody. It was perhaps a bit of an overkill on the government's part. In addition, an anonymous jury had been selected because the government alleged that Joe and other defendants had attempted to obstruct justice previously by threatening a witness, Paul Zarbano, back in 1990. They also believed that both brothers had, according to the testimony of one witness, Sammy Gravano, previously tampered with the jury in alleged Gambino member Edward Lino's trial. Plus, government officials also stated that Joe had bribed public officials in the early 1990s in order to facilitate the escape of one of the Alamita brothers from the INS in Florida. It's unclear if any of these allegations were proven. Probably not. In his opening statements, U.S. Attorney Patrick Fitzgerald told jurors a hitman's kit was found in the bedroom of one of the defendants filled with a gun, bullets, ski mask, and more. Fitzgerald also implied that John had a hand in two other murders, including that of his brother-in-law, Antonio Inzarello, even though this was an allegation that was never proven. It was only based on hearsay information from Sammy Gravano and wasn't even a charge for which John was facing in this trial. And Fitzgerald also trying to paint a picture that Joe and John were major drug traffickers who acted as the main distributors of heroin smuggled into the U.S. from Italy and South America. He told jurors that from 1979 through 1989, John's criminal enterprise involved hundreds of millions of dollars in proceeds from the distribution of narcotics, including heroin and cocaine, as well as loan sharking, extortion, and illegal gambling. Defense lawyers slammed the government's informants almost immediately, telling the jury that informants like Gravano, a disgrazia, a pezza di merda, were killers and liars whose only interest was to sweeten the government deals. And as we learn, there might be some truth to what the defense lawyers alleged. The mozzarella man. Former Sicilian mafioso Francesco Marino Manoia, a.k.a. Mozzarella, was a chemist who manufactured heroin in the labs of Beida, Italy. He also admitted to committing more than 25 murders while he was a member of the Sicilian Mafia. John and Joe's trial was the only time he ever testified in the U.S. against any defendant. He was admitted into the WITSEC program and after being granted American citizenship in exchange for his testimony against the Gambino brothers, a disgraciad, Italy gave him other incentives as well for testifying against Sicilian Mafia members there, including payments of $3,000 a month plus money from his father's pension. What a piece of shit. He also received 600000 for giving evidence against Italian politician Giulio Andrioetti, who was alleged to have mafia associations. According to courtroom documents, Manonia detailed in his testimony several points showing John was the main man pulling the strings in the big business of drug trafficking between U.S. and Italy. He testified that he personally manufactured the heroin king sent to the U.S. and more precisely to Giovanni Gambino. He added that the shipments were sent to John on a regular basis since 1979 after Stefano Botante had created a partnership between himself, Salvatore Inzarello, and John. He also claimed that he had personally met with John on at least three different occasions, the last being to show John how the heroin was made. 
after Manonia's sorry tale, the government put another stellar pentito on the stand. Jesus, did he sing this guy, right? The repentant artiste. Jaspare Mutolo was the former driver and right-hand man of Sicilian mob boss Totorina. While sitting in an Italian prison after his conviction in the Maxi trial, where he was on the third year of his 16-year sentence, he decided to flip sides. A disgraciad, a pezze di merda. Mutulo had admitted to brutally murdering more than 30 people for which he received immunity from the Italian government, therefore allowing him to live free without fear of ever being convicted for his crimes. Italian authorities were hiding him in an empty covenant in the Italian countryside. And at some point after the failure of Kane and Zarbano, U.S. District Attorneys James Comey and Patrick Fitzgerald flew there to gather any information he might know about the brothers to assist in the trial. Although the specific details aren't clear on exactly how they were able to pull the information from Mutolo regarding John, they were able to pull something, and Mutolo came to the U.S. to testify. He claimed that he had organized a deal for a thousand pound shipment of heroin from Italy to U.S. in 1981 and that he handed over 500 pounds of the load to John. It was the only testimony he had against the elder Gambino brother. Manoia and Mutulo had to testify about their past, including an admission to the number of murders they had committed, which between the two of them numbered over 70. But the revelation didn't seem to sit well with the government's ace in the whole witness. In James Comey 2018 book, The Higher Loyalty, Truth, Lies, and Leadership, he stated that Sami Gravano had read an article about Butolo and Manoia's murder history and wasn't happy. According to Comey, when he met with the bullshitter in a conference room in New York, Gravano threw a New York tablet onto the table before me with a look of disgust. He then barked, Jesus, Jimmy, you're making me look like a fucking schoolgirl. It appears that Gravano's ego was a bit bruised because compared to Manonia and Mutolo's body count, he was rather paltry at only 19. Despite Gravano's bruised ego, Comey knew his buddy held the key to putting the Gambino brothers away for good. And maybe, just maybe, the government could save its very red face after several failed informants. The Gambian pouched rat. There are many species of rats in the world. One of the largest is the Gambian pouch rat, which, according to a BBC article, has become an invasive species in some U.S. regions. The article goes on to say that the enormous Gambian pouched rat is one of that fuels the myths about giant sewer rats. So it should be no surprise that the largest, nastiest, and ugly rat to come out of the sewers in John and Joe's trial would be Sammy Gravano. After successfully helping putting Gotti away and not wanting to be outdone by Sicilian informants who had a better hit list than he did, he was able to dust off some old memories, probably imaginary, and tie in John and Joe to a 1981 murder. In April of 1993, Gravano detailed the events of the Francisco Oliveri murder in May of 1981. He testified that John had gotten permission from John Gotti to kill Oliveri in revenge for him killing another member of John's crew. Gravano claimed that John Gotti told me to go on this hit and supervise it and get it done. He testified that his role was backup shooter as well as supervisor of the hit. His team included Joe Gambino and three others, one of which there was an associate who was going to be the shooter as a test before he became a made man. The hit team then gathered surveillance and needed materials, including guns, masks, and getaway cars, and set the date to take out Oliveri. They had decided to kill him in the morning when he left his house to move his car, a routine he performed daily. The day before the murder, Joe reportedly met with Gravano to finalize the details, and the government even showed the jury surveillance footage of Joe entering a social club where Gravano was supposedly waiting for him. On the day of the planned hit, the team showed up late to Oliveri's home and discovered that Oliveri had already moved his car before they got there. The following week, the team tried again. This time, they solved the problem. 
It wasn't as juicy as some of the things he testified in John Gotti's trial. Government believed the Gambian rat had served his purpose. While the prosecution thought that they had the market on the informant witnesses, the defense had a surprise up their sleeve. An old friend comes out of the shadows. In May of 1993, in a surprise move, John and Joe's defense lawyers called Tommaso Busquera as a witness on their behalf. Busquera had been a close friend of the Gambino brothers' father back in Italy, and it was also the first time Busquera had been in New York since his testimony in the Pizza Connection case of the late 1980s. Despite the fact that the Pentito's testimony helped convict over 300 men in Italy in the infamous Moxie trial case and 18 men in the Pizza Connection case, a disgrace. U.S. Prosecutor Patrick Fitzgerald tried to discredit Buscetta by telling the jury that he had received immunity after admitting to a role in three crimes. He seemed to forget that his own witness, Mozzarella Manoia, also had an immunity agreement in Italy which required him to cooperate with American authorities. It was the same exact kind of agreement Buscetta had. In addition, Fitzgerald's prize witnesses had committed a hell of a lot more than three crimes, including more than 90 murders. In addition, while Gravano was the only one who didn't have an immunity agreement, he did have an agreement with the government, which allowed him to receive monetary benefits from the government. A reduced prison sentence, a placement into the WITSEC program after he served only five years for 19 murders and other crimes. In fact, both Busqueda and Manoia were placed into the WITSEC program as well. Still... Fitzgerald continued his quest to discredit Busqueda by asking how many robberies he had committed in his 50 years as a member of the mafia. Busqueda was taken a bit back by the questioning, telling Fitzgerald, I don't know whether you're kidding or not. After all, being completely upfront and honest with the government regarding past history is part of the terms and conditions of being an informant and being allowed into WITSEC program. So, isn't this something that Fitzgerald should have already known, considering how valuable Busquetta's testimony had been? And why would a prosecutor want to discredit the testimony of a man who had helped put so many criminals away? Those are questions to ponder. But let's continue the story. During examination by John's lawyer, George Santangelo, Busquetta claimed he couldn't remember anything about which Santangelo was asking. However, he did admit that one man being portrayed as a drug dealer actually did not deal in drugs. No information could be found on who that one man was. Now that the jury had all the information from both sides of the aisle, it was time for them to decide on John and Joe's fate. The Big Decision on June 5th, 1993, after a four-month trial, the jury had reached their verdict, but they didn't. The jury was hung 11-1 to 1 on all charges except for one. They found Joe and John guilty of bail jumping, but due to a previous agreement, the brothers would not receive a sentence for that conviction. The jurors presented a note to Judge Leisure to explain their thinking regarding their actions, which he read in the courtroom. They stated that they had taken every avenue afforded us in trying to come to a fair verdict. If there are jurors who sincerely cannot find any witness to possess any credibility, then I fear we are wasting the time of many people, including ourselves. Almost immediately, the prosecution cried foul and asked for a new trial date. But there's an interesting side note about what went on in that jury room. According to the Daily News, based on information from a confidential source, juror number eight was being suspicious that juror number one was dishonest. On May 29, during deliberations, juror number eight sent a note to Judge Leisure detailing her suspicions about the holdout juror. She wrote that the jury was deadlocked and the actions of juror number one showed that he had to have been bribed or paid off because he was unwilling to listen to reason, and that while he wasn't stupid, he was most definitely corrupt. She even gossiped about juror number one with the other jurors to see what they thought about this individual who wasn't falling in line. 
Judge Leisure shared the information with Comey and Fitzgerald and eventually called juror number eight into his chambers for a talk. She refused to name the other jurors she talked with, so Leisure segregated her from the other jurors until he could get to the bottom of the drama. He then called in juror number one, and without alluding to his conversation with juror number eight, asked him if he observed any problems in the jury room. Jury number one said that some harsh words had been exchanged, but nothing that would impede a fair and impartial verdict. Eventually, Leisure decided to dismiss juror number eight because he believed that she no longer had the capability of being impartial. Perhaps he speculated she was too young or immature and, was, and wasn't able to handle the pressure of sitting on the panel. The next day, Leisure announced to the jury that jury number eight was dismissed for personal reasons and that the rest of them would have to be the ones deciding the outcome. The confidential source told the NY Daily News that what allegedly happened wasn't surprising. If they fixed the case for Gotti, it makes sense that they would try to fix their own. Joe's lawyer, Bruce Cutler, after being told about the allegation, said every time the government doesn't succeed, they cry foul. And it's just not so. And the powerful and legendary lawyer, Charles Carnese, said it is very dangerous for prosecutors to label jurors corrupt or incompetent when their verdict is not in accord with what they think the outcome should have been. But to this day, James Comey believes that Gambino Brothers paid off juror number one. In his book, he says that there were suspicious circumstances surrounding the holdout juror, but didn't elaborate on what those suspicious circumstances were. It was clear that the government was not going to stop pursuing their targets. And no matter how many times John and Joe went to trial, the government will continue to search the sewers for more rats and add more charges until they could secure the convictions they so desperately desired. A hard choice. John and Joe were going to have a face trial again in November 1993 to face the other nine counts of the indictment. It was a never-ending revolving door. So after consulting with their lawyers and family, they decided to end the aggravation and take a plea deal. John and Joe pled guilty to truck trafficking, racketeering, and conspiracy to murder and were sentenced to 15 years behind bars without parole. In an unusual act of kindness, Judge Leisure decided that because of their strong family ties to jail them closer to home so they could be near their families. The trial was finally over, the sentence was being served, and the smell of freedom was getting closer. The smell of freedom? Not hardly. In October of 2005, a few days before John was to be released from the Devons Federal Medical Center in Massachusetts, where he was serving the last days of his 15-year term, he was arrested by U.S. authorities. Even though he was a naturalized U.S. citizen and had already served his time for the same exact crimes he was convicted in absentia for in 1984, Italian authorities had requested John be extradited to Italy for that conviction. After his initial hearing on the matter, he was taken to Massachusetts Correctional Institution in Plymouth, where he would remain for 17 months until the case was resolved. In March of 2006, the case came before U.S. Magistrate Marianne Bowler in Boston. Prior to the hearing, the government, led by U.S. Attorney Brian Kelly, presented Judge Bowler with a voluminous 29-page memorandum, although in court documents the judge claimed essentially an 18-page filing, detailing why John should be extradited to Italy. While all the specific details of their memorandum is unknown, it's important to note that the similarity in volume to the one the government presented to the judge before Rosario's sentencing hearing in 1984, for which he received the maximum sentence of 45 years, even though he had no prior felony convictions. In the memorandum, the government related testimony by Manonia, as well as details regarding John's plea bargain and subsequent guilty plea in the 1993 case. And based on the information presented in Rosario's case, it's fair to speculate that perhaps there were some rumors thrown in as well. Despite John's argument and response to the government's 
allegations, Judge Bowler ruled in the favor of the extradition because of the narcotic offense charge and the fact that he belonged to a criminal association. Later, John appealed the decision, and in September of 2006, he walked out of prison a free man. U.S. District Judge Reginald Lindsay had overturned Bowler's ruling because John had already served his 15-year sentence in the U.S. and ruled he shouldn't have to be jailed again for the same charges in Italy. In 2007, John appealed to a federal court in New York to have his supervised release time reduced for time served during the extradition case. Once again, the government vigorously fought John, but Judge Peter Leisure, which also happened to be the judge who presided over John's 1990s trial, sided with the defense and credited him with time served. After this release, John Gambino was never arrested or jailed again. Swan Song. In 2008, John allegedly became a part of a three-man panel to oversee the Gambino family after the arrests and convictions of the alleged heads of the family in the FBI's Operation Old Bridge investigation. Besides that law enforcement rumor, John had, for the most part, led a relatively quiet life after his release in prison. He had many health problems over the years, including a stroke in 1985 and heart surgery in 1987. If he wanted to, he could have become boss of the clan in Italy. He could even have become boss of the Gambino family in New York. He certainly had the smarts and skills to do it the style of his cousin, Carlo Gambino. His myriad of health problems might have hindered those aspirations, if he had them. But he was happy staying in the shadows as much as he could running his legitimate businesses and otherwise. John Gambino had been described as a true gentleman, a tough and loyal member of the Gambino family, and a powerhouse who was highly respected and revered by all who knew him. Giovanni John Gambino died on November 16, 2017, in his bed with his shoes off, surrounded by his family and friends. He was 77 years old. Postscript. As an almost poetic twist to John's story, notorious Sicilian boss Toto Riina, to whom John reportedly met in the 80s, died in prison the day after John on November 17th. Riina's death took all the headlines, while John, in death, like he did in life, stayed in the shadows. The end. Salute to the button guys at the NewYorkMafia.com and salute to MS. What a hell of a series. So this concludes our six-part series of the Cherry Hill Gambinos by the button guys at www.thenewyorkmafia.com. Let's not forget that the video was sponsored by Justice Tech Pros. Salute to you again and thank you for sponsoring today's video. And of course, Team Ruckus, Mob Story Season 2. You already know the crew that brings it to you. Everybody salute and have a good day.